to sing the praise of the political process in 2015 on either side of the Atlantic is a deeply rash enterprise. The political, isn't it? The political process is held in profound contempt by a very large part of democratic electorates. And I think this is a very serious problem. I am going to sing its praises, and I'm going to sing them loudly and without reservation. I am, after all, a contrarian. So when everybody else is despairing in it, I'm going to say we need to discover it, rediscover it, and praise it loudly. Let's then look at what happens in 1215, uh, try and get some sense of why it happens very quickly, and then look at what I call the Magna Carta decade. Because if the Magna Carta of 1215 fails and is an absolute failure, the reason for its success are the events of another decade. We all forget, because our fondness for single anniversaries, that 1215 is only the first of a continuous series of reissues of Magna Carta, which go on until 1297. The key ones take place in the decade 1215 to 1225, but they are documents of an absolutely <laughs> radically different nature and are the product of radically different political circumstances. And until we understand, this is where the historian comes in, until we understand that specificity, that local quality, we will understand nothing at all. Right. Why, then, does Magna Carta happen at all? We were, again, talking uh, and, uh, when, when we, we were all assembling uh, uh, before this, uh, this afternoon session. We were talking about the uh, remarkable resemblance between so much modern politics and earlier monarchical and court politics. And one of the points at which, of course, they all centre is the question of the actual personality of the ruler, the president, whoever. The key to understanding why Magna Carta happens is John. John is a younger brother of extreme ambition, an ambition that hugely overtakes his ability. In other words, in Britain, you can make the perfect remark, um, he is a milliband. He is a Miliband junior. Um, he becomes king largely by accident and murder, uh, more or less the same process that produced Ed Miliband. Uh, 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 um, uh, uh, and with all, whereas we can now see with equally disastrous consequences. I mean, you know, look at, look at, look at the suicide of the Labour Party. Anyway, John becomes king in 1199. And again, to get this sense, he is by far the most powerful ruler in Europe. We're very fond, aren't we, many of us in this room, of talking about Anglospheres and all the rest of it. The concept of something distinct, distinct and separate about England, the Anglosphere, English-based civilization, is totally and completely incomprehensible before 1530. In the Middle Ages, England is invariably part of some form of enormous cross-continental empire. And its political institutions are fundamentally similar. And we really do need to understand this. The, the channel only becomes the widest strip of water in the world in the reign of Henry VIII, in which values change mysteriously between Calais uh, and, and Dover, uh, as unfortunately our immigrant class hasn't yet discovered. But the, it will happen. It will happen. The, um, so the, the, um, John then rules over this extraordinary empire which stretches from Scotland through Wales, <coughs> Ireland, and the whole of Western France, which he then proceeds to lose. The key to understanding John is in the splendid phrase of Oscar Wilde uh, in The Importance of Being Earnest. That was on the subject of babies. You will remember that to lose one is a misfortune. Uh, to, 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 to lose two looks like carelessness. John committed the carelessness of losing two empires in very quick succession. In other words, Magna Carta is a product of imperial recession. It's the loss of power, the loss of empire. First, he loses the better half of his French lands against Philip Augustus. Then he uses, what was always the case, the immense wealth of England to try to create a second empire in the British Isles with enormous pressure against Scotland and against Wales. And he does it, of course, by screwing the riches of England and he attacks frontally the two key riches groups, one of which 
is the landed aristocracy. Now, the landed aristocracy tend to have a very, very bad name, um, uh, which they largely deserve. There's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a great element of, of kind of privileged brat pack about them. What's striking about the barons, even at the height of the crisis of Magna Carta, they can't do without a joust which is rugby on horseback. You know, they risk, they risk they, they are American football on horseback uh, uh, with, a, with a frank admission of the intent to do harm to the opposite party. Um, they, 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 they are like that. But they're also, of course, each one of them is a corporation. They are the masters of thousands and tens of thousands of acres. Many of them are surprisingly well-educated, rarely in Latin, but tolerably so, and, but above all, they're able to employ highly skilled, and they have to employ, highly skilled accountants, lawyers, and clergy who can act as theoreticians. Okay. So this group is then put under immense pressure um, by the manipulation of the legal process and so on to, to yield large quantities of money to the king. So is the other, and this is the great point of variation between the world then and the world now. <clears throat> In the uh, England of 1215, the other, by far the richest group, is the church. Uh, when you go around England and many of you will know it at least as well as I do, um, one of its great marvels are the wonderful cathedrals. And we tend to look at those buildings and to think of them erected out of the piety, the pious pennies of, of self-denying peasants. Ladies and gentlemen, nothing could be further from the truth. The cathedrals are the expression of an overweening clerical elite which has roughly the same morals and practices as modern Wall Street bankers. My cathedral front is one wider than your West Cathedral. You know, my West Front is bigger than your West Front. My spire is bigger than your spire, you know, said the abbot to the bishop sort of thing. That, that, that's that world. And so what happens is John also screws this body. But again, what we also need to put into mind are two very different facts about the church. One is that it is an pan-European institutional body. It is the direct ancestor of the EU. The EU has got two direct ancestors. One is the Roman Church and the other is the Roman Empire. And its structures are very, and certainly the Napoleonic Empire, and its structures are very closely related to both. So obviously, uh, attack one member of it and the head in Rome responds. And the second thing that we forget, uh, and it's something that we mustn't forget, the church is a completely separate system of law. It's a separate system of law, um, which is at least as powerful in many ways uh, in its effect as, as, as secular law. I mean, if you look at church law in England right through, even after the royal supremacy, right through to the 19th century, it controls all testamentary jurisdictions. The entire process, of, you know, in subject that's dear to the heart of everybody in this room, the whole subject of property is dealt with by church law and, until the 19th century. So this gives you some idea of, of its power. And of course it is, it is the intellectual powerhouse. And the man who was Archbishop of Canterbury was the leading scholar of the day and the leading university of the day, Stephen Langton, uh, in Paris, because this is the great, these are the glory days of the Sorbonne, which it has to be said it's never fully recovered, but I speak as a, as, speak as a member of the University of Cambridge, but there we are. Um, so uh, that, and that's the background. And uh, John then, all of these endeavors, the loss of the French Empire, the enormous pressure against the English elite, the uh, pressure against the Celtic fringe of England, all of these things come to a tremendous climax in 1212. In 1212, John launches a huge campaign against the Welsh, and taking a leaf out of uh, Donald Rumsfeld's book, there's a little bit of shock and awe. So what he does to bring home to the Welsh that he really means business, he hangs 22 handsome young Welsh aristocratic hostages simultaneously from the walls of a castle. You know, that's the shock and awe. At which point it's revealed to him that his two most important no, two, most, two of his most important secular nobles, a man called Sir de Quincy, the Earl of Winchester, and the, um, uh, what is the real, the, the real key figure in all of this, a man called Robert Fitzwalter, who's a great lord in the north, in East Anglia, but he's also a great figure in the city of London, both militarily, as the captain of the second largest castle in London, of the city militia, and also huge economic interests as a vintner. And if you look in Magna Carta, you will see astonishing attention is given to wine measures and the victualling trade. 
for the very obvious good connections of Fitzwalter. These two of them plot to surrender John to the Welsh. You can imagine what would have been done to John uh, after he'd hanged 22 handsome young Welsh hostages. The plot is revealed. The two flee, of course. They flee to Paris. John then embarks on this extraordinary attempt uh, at re-establishing himself. He reconciles himself with the church, with the Pope, and he wriggles out of the, uh, uh, the, the, the interdict, the, the, the excommunication, not simply of him, but of the whole of England, uh, reconciles himself to Pope Innocent III, and he tries a last desperate throw of the dice against Philip Augustus, his arrival at France, and there's one of those very rare things in the Middle Ages, an absolutely decisive battle. It's the Battle of Bouvines, in 1214, and ladies and gentlemen, John, it's brilliantly conceived, it's on a church Chilean scale. There's an invasion of France from the West, a European commission, uh, a European commission, a European coalition. <laughs> oh, oh, that uh, masterly slip of the tongue. Uh, uh, um, uh, invading, invade, invading from the East. Um, uh, but it all meets a terrible failure at the Battle of Bouvines. It's an absolute and total defeat for John. And it is this <clears throat> combination of the loss of empire, this immense pressure that he's brought to bear on, uh, by perversion of legal process and so on, on his political class. And finally, irreversible, irrefutable military defeat. Okay, that's the background. Very events now begin to move rather quickly. John is confronted the Battle of Bouvines in 1214. At Christmas 1214, he's confronted by a body of the barons demanding something very strange. There had, of course, been lots of rebellions against earlier kings. John's effectiveness in eliminating opposition. In other words, he solved the problem of opposition. Previous rebellions always took place in the name of a rival junior member of the royal house. John had solved this problem by killing them all. There weren't any. So what you have to do, you have to innovate. You rebel not in the name of a person, but of an idea. And the idea is a charter, which is a form of document that will limit the excesses of the king. Incidentally, the idea had first been invented by John's great-grandfather, Henry I, who's another younger son who seizes the throne by usurpation, and he puts forward a manifesto. You know, just like a modern political party coming to power that promises, you know, motherhood and, and apple pie and whatever, and the moment is in power is forgotten. Uh, but the barons don't forget this, and they constantly hark back to it. John says, come back at Easter. They come back. He says, I still can't decide. Come back in a few weeks. And it's at this point that the events, I've alluded to them very quickly at the beginning, John's defeat is now turned into catastrophe because... In May, London opens its gates to the rebel barons. And the barons never lose control of London. Now, this is decisive. John loses what's left of his treasure, his administration, his prestige, his capital. He's finished. That happens on the 17th of May. Within less than two weeks we call it a fortnight, John is negotiating at Runnymede with the barons, and the thing that is the measure of his absolute failure is that his negotiator is the man who'd been his leading ecclesiastical opponent, Stephen Langton, the Archbishop of Canterbury. Very quickly, John, he's got no capital, is forced to come to an agreement. And the agreement, and this is where I think we do need now to, to, to grasp extraordinarily remarkable nature of the Magna Carta of 1215. The Magna Carta of 1215 is an utterly devastatingly radical document. What makes it even more wonderful, you refer to the fact they're all written on animal skin, we not only have the Magna Carta, we have the drafts. We have the actual draft of the document, the Articles of the Barons, which was physically presented to uh, Langton at Runnymede. And ladies and gentlemen, it looks just like a modern negotiating document. Each clause is given in essence, each clause of Magna Carta is reduced to about four or five key phrases. And to what you begin each line with, what do you and I begin each line with when we put a forward a memorandum or heads of an agreement, well, we begin, don't we, with a bullet point. Ladies and gentlemen, 800 years before Microsoft, 
Every line of the Articles of the Barons begins with a bullet point. There is a paraph mark, just like, in fact, um, a, 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 a bass clef in music, but with the tail turned round the other way. And you go through, and all of the key clauses of Magna Carta are there in brief. But, ladies and gentlemen, there's one remarkable thing. Towards the end of the document, it changes. Towards the end of the document, you get continuous Latin prose. And the Latin prose are the bits of Magna Carta that the barons didn't trust the clerks of the king's chancery to develop in full. Because what they wanted was their exact words. And the clauses that they regard as mattering, that they draft out fully, are clauses of genuine revolution. And they are genuinely republican. What the barons do is set up a committee of public safety of 25 barons. They say that this committee of 25 barons will adjudicate all cases between the king and the barons. And when they found in favour of the barons, which surprisingly they invariably do, the king has no time at all, two or three days, to put into full execution the judgment of the barons. And if he doesn't, they license themselves to levy civil war upon him, only accepting the life of the king, the queen, and the prince. They actually, the phrase, the Latin phrase is doing him as much damage as possible. And to make sure this happens, and this again, you know, this gives you a sense of the revolutionary nature of the document, everybody in England is required to replace the oath of allegiance to the sovereign with an oath to the charter. And not only with an oath to the charter, but an oath to the 25 barons, to the judgment of the 25 barons, and to participate in the process of the levying of civil war. Do you all see what I mean? Now, add, add to that, at the same time as agreeing this document, John is also forced to agree uh, to a treaty for the custody of London, which is the most humiliating document that an English king, I think, has ever sealed. It simply takes a form of an indenture the most basic, unhonorific form of legal agreement, and the barons say to the king, we hold London. If you do exactly what we want within two months, they give him a deadline, they give him an ultimatum of the 15th of August. This, it's happening on the 15th of June. If you do exactly what we want by the 15th of August, we'll give you London back. If, we, if you don't, we won't, and you can whistle for it. It's just extraordinary. So this is the document that John has to agree to, that has been revered and whatever. The two key things. First of all, it leads to direct civil war. The document is so contentious that John, who had had absolutely no support before Magna Carta, is able to muster a significant party to fight for him. And secondly, the fact that it has been so manifestly extorted by duress means that it is of no validity in law and particularly no validity in canon law, which enables the Pope to exonerate him from his oath. There's then, to cut a long story short, a savage civil war, which John begins to win, and at which point our two favourite barons, de Quincey and Fitzwalter, realising they fail, face failure, treason and everything else, run over to Paris, and they offer the throne of England to the heir to the throne of France, Prince Louis, who invades England with a very powerful force. Of course, he's got London. The capital surrenders to him. John collapses. The royalist forces fail. And within a few months, the royalists only have four castles. They've got Lincoln. They've got, uh, they've got uh, Dover. Uh, they've got, um, uh, um, uh, what's the thing called, Windsor and Rochester in the southeast of England. Everything is lost. John uh, dies um, at Newark, uh, allegedly of a surfeit of peaches. He had a gluttonous appetite, and his body is carted off to Worcester to be buried. Now, at that point, ladies and gentlemen, England should be over. The whole notion of an Anglosphere should be finished. And what is completely striking about it is Louis and the barons in this civil war had made no attempt whatever at reissuing Magna Carta. Instead... There's a total reversal. John's heir is a little boy of nine. 
And we've already seen from the photographs of Prince George and Princess Caroline that the entire world is a sucker for a royal kid. So there is a coronation of a nine-year-old in diddy little robes and with a little bracelet borrowed from his mother, and the entire nation goes, err. Uh, you know, we all, we, we, we all sigh. Um, but much more importantly, there's this extraordinary fact of a Tory with a brain. Maybe one could make it even more radical statement, a Republican uh, with a brain. Um, we, 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 we have William the Marshal, Earl of Pembroke, who becomes regent. And Marshall does something. This is where everything now gets really exciting. Marshall had fought Magna Carta tooth and nail. He'd risked everything in resisting it. And yet he decides as a regent of the boy king within 13 days of his father's death to re issue it. But he reissues, and this is the key to understanding it, it is a completely different Magna Carta. The Magna Carta of 1215 is four and a half thousand words. It takes an entire sheep to write it on. The Magna Carta of 1216, more than a third of the text has gone. The Magna Carta of 1215 is 60 clauses. The Magna Carta of 1216 is 40. What's gone? Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know whether you're familiar with the rather splendid, we're all interested in politics here, that wonderful television series, Yes, Minister. Magna Carta has been Sir Humphrey-ized. <laughs> Everything difficult has been cut out. All of those clauses setting up committees of public safety, um, uh, licensing rebellion, all of that's gone. The question of the treatment of Jewish bankers has gone. Uh, the business of forest law has gone. Everything is difficult. And it's even better. Sir Humphrey tells you what he's doing. There's this marvellous phrase at the end of the reissued charter which says, um, of course, it was entirely, well, Sir Humphrey, entirely right and proper that all of these weighty and difficult subjects were considered. However, they were really rather awkward. So we've set up a committee. <laughs> Everything is shunted into a committee where it, you know, it, it, it sort of squirms you know, like a laundry basket and only the stuff relating to forest law ever comes out. So what Magna Carta is, the Magna Carta that goes into law is a balance of extreme left of 1215 and the compromise ground of the right in 1260. But the final coup in all of this is there's still one thing that's very much missing from the Magna Carta of 1216. The king in whose name it's issued is a minor. What is the king going to do when he becomes an adult? Will he follow the line of his regent or will he follow the line of his father? One man takes charge, and that's Stephen Langton, who comes, has a sort of second career in his late 70s. Not everybody dies at 20 in the Middle Ages. And Langton sets himself the task of making sure that the boy king, as he becomes an adult, will reissue the charter in an unchallenged fashion in his own name. In other words, eliminate the issue of consent. Ladies and gentlemen, for the first time, I've sort of come up with an idea of principle. Please forget it. How does the Archbishop of Canterbury get the King of England to agree to issue the definitive text of Magna Carta? He takes a leaf out of the book of Seb Blatter. He bribes him. There is a meeting of a proto-parliament which votes up to that point the largest single grant of taxation which had been so agreed, but it's offered to the King on terms. If you reissue the charter, we'll give you the tax. If you don't, we won't. And the king takes one look at the pile of gold and silver and says, yippee, you've got your freedom. That's, that's the origin. But what again, you see, this seems to me, I presented this in exactly the fashion that those who attack politics do. But the product of it, the product of this process is two things. It's not and do, do again, let's be very careful here. You don't suddenly get a notion of a king under law. The idea of a king under law is fought over viciously at the time of the Civil War, four, four, 450 years later. What you do get, you get two things. You get a sense of the matter of government as being a dialogue between ruler and ruled. That's point one. Point two, you get it encapsulated, crystallized 
into a specific institutional form. Because that assembly, giving the grant of taxation in 1225, that assembly is the proto-parliament. The real fully developed proto-parliament, whose anniversary are also celebrating uh, the, the, the parliament of, uh, of, 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 of Simon de Montfort, the 1265 parliament, harks back directly to that. And the whole notion of the grant of taxation in return for the redress of grievance becomes, again, the fundamental institutional base on which all the things that everybody in this room values and that we talk about endlessly depends. In other words, the key to understanding Magna Carta are not the isolated grandiose clauses, promising access to justice and whatever. What tells you they're meaningless is that they're still on the statute book in England, along with the clause promising the freedom of the church. Much good it did them under Henry VIII or the clause promising the freedom of the city of London, much good it did them against Attlee. These grandiose clauses don't mean anything. It's the practical, detailed, institutional operations and consequences of that political process that does. Thank you for all the contrarians. So when everybody else is despairing in it, I'm going to say we need to discover it, rediscover it, and praise it loudly. Let's then look at what happens in 1215, uh, try and get some sense of why it happens very quickly, and then look at what I call the Magna Carta decade. Because if the Magna Carta of 1215 fails and is an absolute failure, the reason for its success are the events of another decade. We all forget, because our fondness for single anniversaries, that 1215 is only the first of a continuous series of reissues of Magna Carta, which go on until 1297. The key ones take place in the decade 1215 to 1225, but they are documents of an absolutely <laughs> radically different nature and are the product of radically different political circumstances. And until we understand, this is where the historian comes in, until we understand that specificity, that local quality, we will understand nothing at all. Right, why then does Magna Carta happen at all? We were again talking... Uh, and uh, when, when we, we were all assembling uh, uh, before this, uh, this afternoon session, we were talking about the uh, remarkable resemblance between so much modern pother of extreme ambition, an ambition that hugely overtakes his ability. In other words, in Britain, you can make the perfect remark, um, he is a milliband. He is a Miliband junior. Um, he becomes king largely by accident and murder, uh, more or less the same process that produced Ed Miliband. Uh, 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 um, uh, uh, and with all, whereas we can now see with equally disastrous consequences. I mean, you know, look at, look at, look at the suicide of the Labour Party. Anyway, John becomes king in 1199. And again, to get this sense, he is by far the most powerful ruler in Europe. We're very fond, aren't we, many of us in this room, of talking about Anglospheres and all the rest of it. The concept of something distinct, distinct and separate about England, the Anglosphere, English-based civilization, is totally and completely incomprehensible before 1530. In the Middle Ages, England is invariably part of some form of enormous cross-continental empire and its political institutions are fundamentally similar. And we really do need to understand this. The, the channel only becomes the widest strip of water in the world in the reign of Henry VIII, in which values change mysteriously between Calais uh, and, and Dover, uh, as unfortunately our immigrant class hasn't yet discovered, but the, it will happen, it will happen. The, um, so the, the um, you London back, if, we, if you don't, we won't, and you can whistle for it. Just extraordinary. So this is the document that John has to agree to, that has been revered and whatever. The two key things. First of all, it leads to direct civil war. The document is so contentious that John, who had had absolutely no support before Magna Carta, is able to muster a significant party to fight for him. And secondly, the fact that it has been so manifestly extorted by duress means that it is of no validity in law. 
and particularly no validity in canon law, which enables the Pope to exonerate him from his oath. There's then, to cut a long story short, a savage civil war, which John begins to win, and at which point our two favorite barons, de Quincey and Fitzwalter, realizing they fail, face failure, treason, and everything else, run over to Paris, and they offer the throne of England to the heir to the throne of France, Prince Louis, who invades England with a very powerful force. Of course, he's got London. The capital surrenders to him. John collapses. The royalist forces fail. And within a few months, the royalists only have four castles. They've got Lincoln. They've got, uh, they've got uh, Dover. Uh, they've got, um, uh, um, uh, what's the thing called, Windsor and Rochester in the southeast of England. Everything is lost. John uh, dies um, at Newark. He's got London. The capital surrenders to him. John collapses. The royalist forces fail. And within a few months, the royalists only have four castles. They've got Lincoln. They've got, uh, they've got uh, Dover. Uh, they've got, um, uh, um, uh, what's the thing called? Windsor and Rochester in the southeast of England. Everything is lost. John uh, dies um, at Newark, uh, allegedly of a surfeit of peaches. He had a gluttonous appetite, and his body is carted off to Worcester to be buried. Now, at that point, ladies and gentlemen, England should be over. The whole notion of an Anglosphere should be finished. And what is completely striking about it is Louis and the barons in this civil war had made no attempt whatever at reissuing Magna Carta. Instead... There's a total reversal. John's heir is a little boy of nine. And we've already seen from the photographs of Prince George and Princess Caroline that the entire world is a sucker for a royal kid. So there is a coronation of a nine-year-old in diddy little robes and with a little bracelet borrowed from his mother, and the entire nation goes, uh, you know, we all, we, we, we all sigh. Um, but much more importantly, there's this extraordinary fact of a Tory with a brain, maybe one could make it even more radical statement, a Republican uh, with a brain, um, we, 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 we have William the Marshal, Earl of Pembroke, who becomes regent. And it's happening on the 15th of June. If you do exactly what we want by the 15th of August, we'll give you London back. If, we, if you don't, we won't, and you can whistle for it. Just extraordinary. So this is the document that John has to agree to, that has been revered and whatever. The two key things. First of all, it leads to direct civil war. The document is so contentious that John, who had had absolutely no support before Magna Carta, is able to muster a significant party to fight for him. And secondly, the fact that it has been so manifestly extorted by duress means that it is of no validity in law, and particularly no validity in canon law, which enables the Pope to exonerate him from his oath. There's then, to cut a long story short, a savage civil war, which John begins to win, and at which point our two favorite barons, de Quincey and Fitzwalter, realizing they fail, face failure, treason, and everything else, run over to Paris, and they offer the throne of England to the heir to the throne of France, Prince Louis, who invades England with a very powerful force. Of course, he's got London. The capital surrenders to him. John collapses. The royalist forces fail. And within a few months, the royalists only have four castles. They've got Lincoln. They've got, uh, they've got uh, Dover. Uh, they've got, um, uh, um, uh, what's the thing called, Windsor and Rochester in the southeast lawn until the 19th century. So this gives you some idea of, of its power. And of course, it is, it is the intellectual powerhouse. And the man who was Archbishop of Canterbury was the leading scholar of the day and the leading university of the day. Stephen Langton uh, in Paris, because this is the great, these are the glory days of the Sorbonne, which it has to be said it's never fully recovered, but I speak as a, as, speak as a member of the University of Cambridge, but there we are. Um, so uh, that, and that's the background. And uh, John then, all of these endeavors, the loss of the French Empire, the enormous pressure against the English elite, the uh, pressure against the Celtic fringe of England, all of these things come to a tremendous climax in 1212. In 1212, John launches a huge campaign 
against the Welsh. And taking a leaf out of uh, Donald Rumsfeld's book, there's a little bit of shock and awe. So what he does to bring home to the Welsh that he really means business, he hangs 22 handsome young Welsh aristocratic hostages simultaneously from the walls of a castle. You know, that's the shock and awe. At which point it's revealed to him that his two most important no, two, most, two of his most important secular nobles, a man called Sir de Quincy, the Earl of Winchester, and the, um, uh, what is the real, the, the real key figure in all of this, a man called Robert Fitzwalter, who was a great lord in the north, in East Anglia, but he's also a great figure which is rugby on horseback. You know, they risk, they risk, they, they are American football on horseback uh, uh, with, a, with a frank admission of the intent to do harm to the opposite party. Um, they, 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 they are like that. But they're also, of course, each one of them is a corporation. They are the masters of thousands and tens of thousands of acres. Many of them are surprisingly well educated, rarely in Latin, but tolerably so, and, but above all, they're able to employ highly skilled, and they have to employ, highly skilled accountants, lawyers, and clergy who can act as theoreticians. Okay. So this group is then put under immense pressure um, by the manipulation of the legal process and so on to, to yield large quantities of money to the king. So is the other, and this is the great point of variation between the world then and the world now. <clears throat> In the uh, England of 1215, the other, by far the richest group, is the church. Uh, when you go around England and many of you will know it at least as well as I do, um, one of its great marvels are the wonderful cathedrals. And we tend to look at those buildings and to think of them erected out of the piety, the pious pennies of, of self-denying peasants. Ladies and gentlemen, nothing could be further from the truth. The cathedrals are the expression of an overweening clerical elite which has roughly the same morals and practices as modern Wall Street bankers. My cathedral 